Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, I like to watch the TV show Alaska State Troopers. And every now and then there's an episode that reminds us how dangerous it is for pets living in that state. On one particular episode, there was a woman resident of Juneau, who let her dogs out the door to go outside. All of a sudden, she heard one of her dogs yelping. It was Fudge, her dachshund. She goes rushing out, and there she sees Fudge in the mouth of a black bear who is carrying it off like a salmon. She goes rushing after the two. And when she catches up to them, she did the only thing she could think of. She punched the black bear in the nose. And it must have been quite a punch, because the black bear dropped the dog and ambled off. Later on, she was talking to the Alaska State Trooper. And she admitted it was a completely stupid thing for her to do, to confront that black bear and punch it in the nose just to save her dachshund. The great risk really wasn't worth the reward. Today, as we consider to what end our God was willing to go to rescue us from the jaws of sin, death, and hell, and Satan, it makes us marvel that God would do such a thing. It's a more wondrous thing than that woman confronting a black bear that he would save you and me, the sinners that we are not with some adrenaline rush, temporarily blinding his senses, but with full knowledge, completely understanding the great risk, Jesus not only risked his life, but gave it up, suffering the pain and punishment of hell itself to rescue you and me. As we look at that, we see this act of the Lord by which he redeemed us and has forgiven us is something that doesn't make sense. Not by our human standards. How God redeemed us, we can understand somewhat because the basic elements of that are given to us in God's word. But why God redeemed us, that really doesn't make any sense at all. We don't deserve it in any way, shape, or form. But that's just who our God is. The God of perfect grace. The God who in his undeserved love gave his own son to come into this world and rescue us. Today we continue our summer sermon series looking at the Apostles' Creed by taking a look, first look, at the second article of the Apostles' Creed. And as we do so, each and every one of us can marvel that we can say the words, God has redeemed me. And today, let's look at what this means for us. We read our text, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. We also read Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Today, as we begin our study of the second article of the Apostles' Creed, looking at Jesus, the Son of God, we talk about redemption. And as we talk about Christ's redemption of us, we need to define terms. In the biblical sense, that word redeem is not talking about coupons. Whenever you hear or read that word redeem in the Bible, it's talking about buying back. It's talking about paying a price to rescue. Whenever you hear that word or read that word, think of ransom. A ransom that's paid to get someone out of captivity. But of course, to say that Christ redeemed us means that we needed to be rescued in the first place. And we did. But from what did we need to be rescued? I've never been a slave to anyone. 
I've never been kidnapped. What did we need to be rescued from? Well, we need to be rescued from Satan himself. I was once a slave to sin. Coming into this world born unbeliever, hostile to God, I could only sin. And that's how everyone's born into this world. And there's nothing anyone can do about it on their own to get themselves out of that captivity to sin and Satan. Oh, sometimes we look at sin and we say, well, sin's not that bad. It's not that bad to be in sin's clutches. We can even say some sins look kind of nice to us. Think about selfishness masked in manipulation. Here we are, giving of our time, our energy, our very selves in serving others. But what's behind all of that? We're doing it because we want them to do something for us, or we're doing it so we look good in the eyes of the world, or we're doing it just so we feel good about ourselves. That's selfish sinfulness, mass and manipulation. And oftentimes we don't even recognize that as being wrong. That shows how steeped in sin all of us are, even after we've been rescued from the clutches of Satan. Slaves of sin. That's how God describes us in his word as what we were, slaves of sin. And as such, we're slaves to the devil who holds the power of sin. And what could we possibly do to escape all of that? We couldn't improve. We couldn't stop sinning. And even if we did stop sinning, that wouldn't undo the sinning we've already done. Now imagine, if I were kidnapped tonight, and a ransom note was delivered to our church president's demanding $1 million by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. What would happen? Well, I'd probably have a long stay. I can just see our church president saying he's not worth that. <laughs> but as far as the question, would you do something like that? How about could you? Could you in such a short time frame get together that $1 million? Well, the odds of you raising $1 million overnight is far greater than the odds of you getting yourselves out of the clutches of Satan. Can't be done. We needed rescue. And thank the Lord, we have that rescue. Martin Luther, in his small catechism, explanation to the second article states, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, he has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. The ransom was paid. The ransom was made for us to rescue us. But that ransom was far greater than a million dollars. In fact, no amount of money could pay that ransom. No sacrifice could be made on our part not even the sacrifice of another human being. Every human being's a sinner needs ransom themselves. No. We can't ransom ourselves. And that's why the psalmist wrote, No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. No, the ransom is not something we can do. It's not something we can afford. That ransom price is something only God could afford. As Luther put it in his explanation, he has redeemed me from all sins, death and the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. In order for that ransom to be made by God, and it could only be made by God, God had to become a human being. The only way, as our text says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy the devil. He shared in our humanity. But you might ask, why did he have to take on flesh and blood? Isn't Jesus God? Couldn't he have just spoken and put the victory into place? 
well, it really doesn't work that way. You see, Jesus wasn't just conquering an enemy. He was winning over you and me, his enemy, to belong to him. And in order for him to do that, he had to take our place. Maybe this will help explain it. And for you parents with young kids, you can understand this. Sometimes parents in their homes decorate certain rooms by writing sentences on a wall. It might be from the Bible or maybe funny quotes. You sometimes see this in restaurants too. Now the big cardinal rule for the children is that they are never ever to take pens or markers or colors and color on any book, carpeting, walls. They're not to color on anything but that paper that's designated for coloring or they get in trouble. Well, then why can mom and dad write on the walls, if you will? Well, the answer is obvious, because it's their house. They own it. They can do what they want with it. They don't have to obey that rule because it's their rule. They made it. They enforce it. They're not under that rule. In a similar way, God can end human life whenever he wants. And it's not murder because that life belongs to him. It's his life. He gave it. He takes it away. But what does this all have to do with our redemption? Well, if Jesus were to rescue us and make it so that we could be living in heaven, he'd have to make us perfect. And in order to make us perfect, he'd have to be perfect in our place. And in order for him to be perfect in our place, he had to be under his own law. And in order for him to be under his own law, he had to be one of us, become human like you and me. Our text from Galatians says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. He took on human flesh and blood so he could be born under that law. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he took on human flesh and blood to be under that law, to keep it perfectly for us. But there's more to it than just that. His perfect keeping of God's law in our place gave us that A plus 100% in God's record book. But the sins we've committed still need to be removed. And to do that, Jesus had to take the punishment for those sins that we deserve on himself, the very punishment of hell itself. He had to die, and in order for him to die, he had to become a human being too. As Jesus stated, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The ransom. Luther states in his explanation, he has redeemed me with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. Jesus became human to be born under the law. He remained true God to keep that law perfectly in our place. Jesus became human to die on the cross and pay for our sins. He remained true God so that that death would count, would cover our sins being paid for. So how did God redeem us? By the God-man, Jesus Christ, coming into this world as a human being and keeping that law perfectly for us and dying on the cross, suffering the hell we deserve to take those sins away. That's the how. But why did God redeem us? That I don't know. Why Jesus went chasing after death itself and entered the jaws of hell itself to save me, who's worth far less than a dachshund because of the, 
how much I've sinned and rebelled against God. I don't know. Why would he do that? I don't know. But I do know this. As Martin Luther said in his explanation to the second article, he has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. And he's done the same for you. How did God redeem us? We just answered that. Why did God redeem us? We probably will never be able to comprehend it. That leaves only one question left to be answered. And that's this. As blood-bought, redeemed children of God, how will you spend your life? What are you willing to live for and die for? And I hope it's more than just a dachshund or any other dog for that matter. I hope it's for your Lord and Savior. That seeing all he's done for you, that you eagerly and gladly be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. May God give you the faith, the conviction, and the strength to look to that statement and say, this is most certainly true. Amen.